today we are going to discuss uh, politics of language in India. Uh, you can also frame this lecture as language and politics in India or uh, linguistic politics in India. Uh, as we know that uh, India is a country where uh, several populations uh, having very different uh, languages, uh, they cohabit uh, together, they, they stay together. Um, in other words, it is a bit different from uh, the, Euro the European notion of, of uh, the nationhood. Uh, the European concept of nation is uh, one nation, one culture, one language. Uh, but in India, uh, you have one country, one nation, but uh, you have very different uh, languages and very different uh, kind of uh, cultures. Um, if you uh, look at Hindi, which is uh, largely uh, spoken in uh, various parts of India, uh, specifically in the northern part of, of India, uh, a kind of amalgamated uh, population uh, of, of Hindi uh, is still the half the population of India. Now, in this respect, uh, we have uh, the the concept of diversity uh, in in India in terms of uh, what we say as unity in diversity. Uh, but India is uh, more than unity in diversity; rather, it is unity with diversity. And we will today uh, we are going to discuss that how that uh, the recognition of linguistic diversity is a very important feature of of the Indian nation state before independence. Uh, the colonial uh, powers, uh, they first inculcated uh, the medium of instruction as an in English uh, in, the, in various uh, colleges and uh, universities, particularly in the colonial, uh, during the colonial period, in order to uh, equip um, uh, a native uh, officials who will uh, support or uh, and at the same time who will also cooperate with the British uh, administration. Now, uh, after independence, uh, the constitution uh, has provided uh, uh, the scope for uh, for the populations to uh, learn uh, in very uh, various languages and also uh, educate themselves in various languages. Now, the uh, the often the the game of uh, political uh, use of language uh, has been often contested between English, Hindi, and regional uh, languages. Uh, also, uh, there was an issue of the Hindi Urdu controversy, uh, and although and this whole Hindi Urdu controversy precisely. Uh, uh, poses us this question that how the politicization of language is possible. Because in, in the colonial period, uh, he, both Hindi and Urdu were not uh, identified with a particular religion. Uh, and certainly in the early colonial period, uh, you know, the Hindi and Urdu were spoken by various different uh, uh, religions. So let's say uh, Urdu was, speaking, uh, was spoken not only by Muslims, but also by Hindus and Punjabis. Uh, whereas, um, uh, you know, Hindi was also spoken by uh, both Muslims uh, and, and Hindus. But from the colonial uh, times, particularly in late colonial times, the politicization of the Hindi-Urdu uh, controversy that happened and, uh, and then this whole construction, the political construction of uh, and the political identification uh, with Hindi and uh, Hindu whereas Muslim and Urdu, that, that became evident. So there is a kind of a political construction of the Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan. And in today's lecture, we are going to discuss that this whole Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan, how that was also challenged uh, by um, certain linguistic groups, particularly uh, in, in Tamil Nadu, uh, uh, which, where the southern India had a very different kind of a response, uh, where the Aryanization of, of India, they, had, they, they, they thought that there is a kind of a linguistic hegemony of, of Hindi over the southern languages, particularly in uh, the Tamil um, Kannad, uh, Telugu, and the Malayalam languages. Also in the Eastern India, uh, they also supported uh, this uh, this idea of uh, of Hindi. Uh, uh, you know, th this whole uh, idea that Hindi is getting uh, kind of dominating other other languages. So, so there was uh, these debates that uh, we will uh, come to this late lecture.
Now the constituent uh, and the constituent assembly uh, was faced uh, with uh, was faced with several linguistic issues. Uh, one of the major issues was indeed the linguistic division of India, a demand uh, the Congress had never earlier fully rejected. So it was a kind of a half-hearted attempt that uh, that we could we could think about that but but you know there it was not fully rejected neither it was fully accepted so the congress position during the constituent assembly was a bit ambivalent uh, a kind of ambiguous position there were also uh, the questions of national and or the official language uh, its script um, and uh, how the languages uh, would be used uh, that kind of an argument also also ca came up in the constituent assembly uh, then the issue of the linguistic minorities uh, that was another issue which was debated in the constitution then the issue uh, of what mode of form of language uh, should uh, modern indian education institutions would follow so what would be the medium of instruction in in universities and colleges uh, what would be the linguistic medium in courts that is that was also another another issue which was uh, which was very much uh, discussed in the uh, in the constituent assembly then the role of english uh, and how it should be used uh, in in the place of hindi if hindi was uh, is not getting used everywhere because uh, not uh, so let's say in southern and north and, and eastern india uh, you know uh, most of the population uh, people in uh, they don't understand hindi so how so so english become a kind of a uh, a bridge uh, between uh, the hindi and the non hindi uh, speakers so that was another uh, issue which was discussed in the constituent assembly now the conclusions of the debates uh, that led to several provisions uh, regarding the language in the indian constitution uh, that we must now discuss now in the in the indian constitution articles 343 to 351 so that nine articles which comes under the eighth schedule uh, deal with the issues of uh, languages in the country now hindi in the devanagari script uh, is the official language of the union as per the constitution and several uh, according to that early provision uh, in the constitution is the official language of the union and several special directives had also been given for the promotion and development of hindi in article 351 it was to be constantly enriched according to the constitution by borrowing from other indian languages and drawing whenever necessary or desirable for its vocabulary primarily on sanskrit and secondarily on other languages now according to article 343 clause 2 the constitution provides for the use of english for all official purposes for a period of 15 years so in other words the constitution was put into operation on the 26th of january 1950 now from then on the next 15 years which is till 1965 26 january english would be the official language for a period of 15 years that was according to the article 343 clause 2 however by 1965 uh, widespread riots in in south southern india and the uh, uh, was happened and it happened this, those riots were the result of the fears of domination of hindi and aryanization uh, so an aryanization of 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 the dravida uh, kind of a language so 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 the dravidians particularly in south india uh, the dravid movement they they first argued that look there is a kind of a hindi domination over 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 south uh, so with the fears of this whole hindiization of or the area and the aryanization of the dravida land there were linguistic rights and um, and uh, that made it very clear that the english uh, should not be completely demoted from its official status. It took 66 deaths and two self-immolations in the anti-Hindi student agitation in Tamil Nadu for the government, uh, in other words, the central government, to realize that a language could not be imposed on any persons against their wishes and that repression of a student movement would automatically involve uh, parents teachers and the whole community so 
English was assured the status of the associate official language by 1965. The constitution provides that English will be the language of the high courts, supreme court and acts of parliament. The constitution also provides for the rights of its citizens to make representation in any language to the state. It was the amended official language act of 1967. Another development was the political realization that the battle of regional languages, which is the majority of majority languages in the in different linguistic states, to contain the supremacy of Hindi had better chances of winning by having English as the contestant against Hindi rather than the regional languages themselves. This realization was uh, shared by many states in the southern, eastern and northeastern parts of, of India, uh, which is besides uh, Tamil Nadu. So, so Tamil Nadu was one of the spearheading uh, state against Hindi, uh, but that kind of a concern of uh, that, that there is a Hindi supremacy over other linguistic states, this kind of a concern of Tamil Nadu was shared by other southern states as well as uh, other eastern and northeastern states. Now, this uh, uh, act, uh, which is the official uh, language act, uh, that became possible because of the changed political equations, including the rise of regional political parties. Now, remember, from the 1967 uh, onwards is also the emergence of the regional political parties. Uh, in the 1967, the, con the Congress uh, lost uh, elections uh, in eight important states, um, uh, including in, in Tamil Nadu and uh, and in West Bengal. Um, and uh, it actually gave rise to this whole emergence of the regional political parties. Um, and, and that all was also very instrumental uh, in, in kind of contesting Hindi, not only by just by English, but now with the emergence of, of, of regional languages, uh, that, that is also uh, very much evident now. So it is kind of uh, synchronizing uh, with the developments in Indian politics. The rise of the of the regional political parties in in the many uh, states uh, and the changed attitudes towards uh, English uh, from being a language of political oppression to a language of progress, from a language of economic deprivation uh, of the rural masses to a language of centrally planned development for all, from a divisive language of the administration to unifying language of the constitution, and from a language of political inequality to a language of ethnic neutrality. And these were the issues that was now being debated. With the emergence of the regional political parties and with the emergence of the regional um, politics, uh, the Official Language Act made the central government responsible for the development of regional languages in the states as languages of the nation, not just of their regions alone. And that's, that's very, uh, very significant. The makers of the constitution felt it necessary to make a list of major Indian languages in the eighth schedule. As Austin, uh, Granville Austin, the political scientist, uh, which is, who is also the constitutional expert, uh, pointed out, uh, uh, the major advantage was re really um, psychological, uh, psychological, particularly uh, for those who feared the domination of the protagonists of Hindi. It was an open list and more languages could be added to it. The inclusion, on the other hand, would cost almost nothing to the state in financial or administrative terms, but would lend a distinct aura to the language to be included on the other hand um, in the eighth schedule. Now, the first language to be included in the, in, in the schedule was Sindhi. The 1992 amendment uh, introduced Konkani, Manipuri and Nepali, Nepali, bringing the number of languages to 18. So now in the eighth schedule, uh, 18 languages are being recognized uh, after several amendments that we have just uh, pointed out. Four more languages were added in December 2003, Bodo, Santhali, Maithili and Dogri, bringing the total number to 22. So as of now, we like, you know, uh, you have now 22 languages which are now being recognized 
in the eighth schedule of our constitution. As in each of the foregoing cases, the politics of uh, each is specific, but at the root of all root of it all are questions of psychological insecurity, community pride, and national recognition. When the 1961 census noticed that the number of Hindi speakers was declining and people were claiming their languages, their mother tongue as Bhojpuri, Avadi, or Maithili, Braja, Bundeli, etc. as a native languages, the Government, uh, the central government, by the, by the 1971 census, decided to include all of them under the rubric of Hindi. So, uh, you know, so Bhojpuri, Avadhi, Maithili, Braja, Bundeli, they all came under Hindi. To the Maithilis, this was a completely uh, unacceptable, unacceptable situation uh, because, uh, you know, they, they, they speak Maithili and not Hindi, which is very different. Now, the, the then Prime Minister had promised to have their language included in the 8th schedule and he did so. Uh, the government also decided to include Do Dogri to win back the confidence of the people of Jammu region, once again a very sensitive area. The 8th schedule is rather obliquely referred to, art, uh, to in Articles 344 Clause 1 and 351 of the Constitution in the context of enriching Hindi. Over a period of time, the eight schedule languages have acquired a special status in the Indian polity in terms of administration, education, films, and literary awards. Now, we are going to discuss on the linguistic reorganization of states. India remains a land of uh, many languages, as we know, uh, each of it with a very distinct script, grammar, vocabulary, and uh, literary traditions. Rather than deny this diversity, the Congress uh, sought to give space to it uh, uh, as, as early as 1917, uh, 1917, the party had committed itself uh, to the creation of linguistic provinces in a free India. In fact, after the Nagpur session of the Congress in 1920, this principle was extended and formalized with the creation of Provincial Congress Committees, PCCs, by linguistic zones, the Karnataka Pradesh PCC, Orissa PCC, Maharashtra PCC, etc. A point to be noted is that these did not follow and were often at odds with the administrative divisions of British India. Nehru and Gandhi were both active proponents of this uh, reorganization principle. Nehru, appreciative of the linguistic diversity of uh, India, wrote in his 1937 essay that our provincial languages are no dialects or vernaculars, as the ignorant sometimes call them. They are ancient languages with a rich inheritance, each spoken by many millions of people, each tied up inextricably with the life and culture and ideas of the masses as well as the upper classes. However, this marked Nehru's view in 1937. It was an earlier position of Nehru. Nehru changed his position later on. A decade later, he questioned the very premise of linguistic reorganization. So, remain, so remember, so that in, in another 10 years, he, he, he is kind of contradicting his own position. In 1947, the country gone through a violent partition on the basis of uh, religion and face onslaught of millions of refugees from East and West Pakistan and undeclared war in Kashmir, the nuances of formulating a new constitution, the scheduling of elections and the need for executing strong economic policies, these were certain issues which made Nehru to rethink about his 1937 position of creating states on the basis of linguistic identities. Dividing it further on the basis of language would only serve to weaken the union. That was what Nehru's position now, which is like in 1947. In his speech to the Constituent Assembly, three months after independence, uh, he further voiced uh, the, the, the priorities of the government as uh, in the following words, the first essential is therefore for India as a whole to be strongly and firmly established, confident in her capacity to meet all possible dangers and face and meet all problems. If India lives, all parts of India also live and prosper. If India is 
effabled, all her component claimants grow, uh, grow weak. The creation of linguistic provinces uh, was to be deferred until such a time when India was consolidated and strong. Nehru's stance had the support of Patel and Sri Raja Gopalachari. Under Patel's jurisdiction, a committee was appointed under S.K. Dhar, a judge of the Allahabad High Court in 1948, which declared that though the force of popular sentiment remained strong, in the prevailing unsettling conditions, the first and last need of India at the present, uh, present moment is that it should be made a nation. The verdict caused discontent among large sections of the assembly as most Congress members who spoke Marathi insisted on a separate state of Maharashtra. Similar were the aspirations of the Congress uh, leaders. Um, uh, Congress leaders who were uh, who, whose mother tongue was Telugu, uh, Kannada, Malayalam, or Odia. To assuage the members, a fresh uh, committee was appointed in December 1948, which was called the JVP uh, Committee after the initials of its members: Jawaharlal Nehru, so J for Jawaharlal Nehru, Ballabai Patel, so V, and the Patavi Sitaramaya, uh, P. It, however, reinstated the earlier position and argued that language was not only a binding force but also a separating one and that the primary consideration must be the security, unity and economic prosperity of India. The report submitted by the JVP committee has been described as cold water therapy by Robert King as it slowed things down for a while but fire soon started again in 1948 and 1949 with, renew, with, with a kind of renewed enthusiasm for linguistic autonomy. Campaigns existed for uh, Samyukta Greater Karnataka, uh, aiming, aiming to unite Kannada speakers across the states of Madras, Mysore, Bombay and Hyderabad. Uh, Samyukta Maharashtra, which aimed to bring together Marathi speakers in a single political unit. The Malayalis too wanted a state of their own based on the merger of the princely states of Cochin and Travancore with Malabar. And there existed a Maha Gujarat movement. Different from this set of demands was a struggle for a Sikh state in the Punjab. This brought together claims of language as well as religion. Now, it precisely uh, happened uh, that the linguistic reorganization of states uh, were very much a product of this whole uh, tussle between this whole idea of the unity and the idea of the diversity. What India has actually uh, done uh, uh, is, is that as uh, the, uh, whether, whether it is the creation of, uh, of, of, of the uh, linguistic reorganization state, whether it is the creation of the Punjab or Maharashtra, the Gujarat, Ma Andhra Pradesh, um, uh, in the, the old, older Bengal Suba, you have the Bengal, Orissa, Assam, and Bihar, uh, and and each has their own language, um, except Bihar, except Bihar, who, who speaks um, the majority of the language uh, people speak Hindi. Uh, uh, Bengal, Orissa, and Assam, they all speak their native languages, which which uh, which are part which are different from from Hindi. In other words, the, the, the idea of diversity, the recognition of diversity uh, was very much foregrounded uh, by, by Indian, uh, in, in, Indian parliamentarians who, who amended the constitution later on. And as historian Ramachandra Guha believes that the creation of linguistic states was among other things a victory of the popular will. It was the people who wanted uh, this, this change and it is only happening because there are conditions of a representative democracy in, in India. When it began, uh, the movement for linguistic states generated deep apprehensions among the nationalist elite. They feared it would lead to the balkanization of India, to the creation of many more Pakistans. Now, evidently, that didn't happen. And if you contrast with the 1952, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, Times of India, uh, what Times of India was saying in the 1952, and I'm quoting that, uh, that, and Times of India in the February 1952 say that any attempt 
at redrawing the map of India on the linguistic basis would only give the long-awaited opportunity to the reactionary forces to come into open and assert themselves. Now, certainly, that did not happen. India did not broke uh, broke apart, uh, even if you had linguistic reorganization of states, even if you have newer states with uh, their local languages. Uh, India did not broke up. That will that will lay an X at the very root of India's integrity. Well, that was the concern that 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 with the linguistic reorganization of states would do. But that is precisely didn't happen. The movements for linguistic states, however, revealed an extraordinary depth of popular uh, feeling and redefined what it meant to be Indian.